Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life with Sabine Parza. Hi everybody, this is Sabine Parza with another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. My guest today is Peter Pleyer. Peter is a dancer and a choreographer who lives in Berlin. He has studied dance and choreography at the European Dance Development Center in Arnhem, where he also lived for 10 years. He is currently the artistic director of Cranky Bodies, a company together with his partner Michael Kuiper. They founded the company in 2020. Peter has been involved in dance for over 30 years. He has worked as a dancer, a choreographer, a lecturer, a teacher, an artistic programmer for the Tanztage in Berlin or, and as a programming team member of the Sophien Seele in Berlin. He has choreographed solos, group works, and he works with improvisation and contact improvisation. He combines his choreography with design, visual art and photography. In this podcast, we talk about collaborations and the quality of uh, collaborations that interest him. We talk about his m development over many decades, tying in the different aspects of his work to the point of where he decided to be a full-time choreographer again. We talk about improvisation as an undercurrent for everything that he does or that we do and that we share this uh, joy in improvisation. We talk about his formative years in Arnhem and we also talk about identity and fluidity in this identity as a queer artist. I'm very happy to share this episode here with Peter Playa. Hello everybody. <laughs> this is Sabine Panza with another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. My guest today is Peter Playa. Hi, Peter. So nice to see hey, you. Hey, hello. Hey, Sabine. Hi. We were just doing warm up exercises. I think we should continue them for a bit. What did you do? Something with the mouth, like. <laughs> it's always ah. good. You're trained as an actor, right? That also comes from that background. Well, I think there's a more to a story. I'm not really trained as an actor, but I worked as an actor in the German mm. dance in the German theater system. Mm. Yeah, but you know, we we can stretch a little bit. We can do a little mini uh, micro movement warm up here. Um, those of you, our our listeners who are only listening to us, you have to imagine us rolling around our seats right now until we're ready to actually start speaking. <laughs> Hi, Peter. It's so nice to see you. Um, I've known you, I think, since 2008. I think this is when I first met you at one of, uh, one of the Contact Budapest festivals. Do you remember? I don't remember a year so much because I, uh, I went there every year. And uh, it, it's blurring, uh, you know, these experiences are so strong and uh, there's no, there's usually no year date mm. to the experiences and to the meetings, mm. but uh, mostly to the places that it happened. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's a big, it's one big memory, these 10, 15 years with Esther in Budapest. Mm. Yeah, so Esther Gall, who was already on this podcast, she is uh, a a friend that uh, we both share in common. I think she's a lifelong collaborator. I'm just going to propose that here, that she's going to be your lifelong collaborator. I'm assuming that. <laughs> That's true. It's, tr it's totally true. And uh, yeah, it's a dear friend of mine, Esther, and she invited me to the Contact Budapest Festival. And this is where I first met you. I remember in 2008 and then nine again in 2011. And then we re-met also in different different contexts in the contemporary dance uh, world. Um, I also remember you being here in Vienna at Tanzquartier, um, but then also at Impuls Dance Festival. So um, yeah, I value you for your knowledge, for your you-ness. I, I love Peta being just the way you are you and yourself and how you have stayed yourself after uh, over all these years so and uh, and you're 
artistic clarity or your artistic visions. I find them very beautiful. So I'm honored to have you here. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I, I like I like these meetings to be uh, yeah, reminded of history and reminded of shared values and reminded of uh, activities that are also uh, like are happening now, but are also hinting towards the future. Um, since we're talking about the history, I have one very particular memory. Um, I don't know if you remember, of course, but I think it was in 2011, we had two days of teachers meeting before the contact festival. <laughs> And Eva Karsak was also uh, present. And uh, we, I think we began in the teachers meeting, we began kind of being organized and began sort of having a schedule of what we wanted to do. And at one point we just couldn't, like we, even without speaking about it, we completely let go of <laughs> any structure and just went from one improvisation to the next. And I remember one day where we started in the morning and we were improvising on so many different levels. Like I remember you at one point knitting, you were heavily, I don't know if you're still, or crocheting. Was it crocheting or knitting? I do both, but mostly in art context, I crochet. Yeah. So at one point you were, you were crocheting and somebody was singing and some of us were dancing. And then we kind of collectively decided to take a lunch break, but the lunch break was just as as sort of in this performancey mode without being artificial and then at one point we just all landed back into the studio and we just continued rolling and it just became one big sort of life art experience and it was so touching to me i, re I remember that so viscerally also because it was so real in a way we were just us we didn't have to prove it to anybody. And there were all these great artists there. Esther was there. I remember um, uh, Kata, Kata Kovac from, uh, from Berlin was also there. And it was just flowing. It was just flowing from one moment to the next. And I remember that as a beautiful collaborative uh, process with you also. Yeah, it's nice that you say this because it is really also a lot in this teaching of Eva, but also of Mark Tompkins that I worked with in France, that uh, he also really stresses this idea of uh, not having uh, a big score or not knowing what to do, that we all can actually be together in the same space and do things together and, and, and meet on this improvisational level and get a lot of things done. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah once yeah, I also think like I, I did I do actually really uh, call myself an improviser more and more and um, and it impl implies just a, on a lot of levels mm -hmm. on how I, I live my life and how I uh, do my art and uh, also teaching it's, mm -hmm. it's all very uh, um, informed by this notion of improvisation mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of teachers before me, a lot of people that I worked with, but also, yeah, a lot of uh, students and young people that I work with. So improvisation as a life practice, not only on the life, yeah. but it, it is sort of encompassing <clears throat> everything that we do, whether, I mean, you, we, I would like to get into your story, actually, and into all the things that you have done, so as much as has place here. But one of the things that um, I'm always quite fascinated is, is versatility. And you bring a lot of different aspects of yourself into the field of dance and into the field of improvisation. You are a dancer, you're a choreographer, but you also worked as an artistic director, for instance, for the Tanz, um, Tanztage Berlin. You were also in the team of the programming directors of Sophie Seele. So you also have an, uh, a structural up obviously a structural uh, compositional mind that not only consider concerns your own work but also more programming you do lectures you teach um, so I, I like the versatility of that and if we can have improvisation as sort of the underlying currency uh, it kind of creates a it creates a for me, it kind of creates a trust also when I work with people. If I know that they have an improvisational um, mind, then I know that I can probably do almost anything with them. I can also disagree with them or I can find uh, a place of not necessarily 
being happy, but as long as we're improvising, we're going to get through that. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I think there is a specificity in dance improvisation that uh, that has to do with the body and the space, mm -hmm. and of course the movement. Uh, and uh, what is what is special in dance improvisation is that more people can actually do it together. Mm -hmm. So group improvisations are, are possible. Now, when we speak, uh, you and me, it's always one is speaking, one is listening. Mm -hmm. It's also an improvisation, but it's very, it's much more limited in the sense that we cannot in this way improvise together while speaking. So I think there is something very special in dance improvisation. And then in dance improvisation, because it's not so much on words and wording, and it's more about the body and motion and the connection you have with people in the space and the space over time uh, that uh, that that holds this uh, also a history and lots of people have researched it and lots of people have uh, acquired knowledge that we thrive on and that we can use and and that's part of what i'm in my teaching, I really bring very specific uh, structures and scores of improvisation. Um, Peter, I would love to hear a little bit about your story. I know that you are you grew up in, close to Frankfurt. Um, I, from what I know of your story, you uh, started dancing when you went to uh, the European Dance Development Center. Is that how it was yeah. called in Arnhem? And this is also where you yes. met uh, the famous Est Esther Gall. <laughs> but from what yes. I know also from the time there and what Esther has also shared in the podcast, that was a very rich time with lots of great artists that had these residencies. But even before that, what was your, what was your introduction to dance? What made you decide to investigate, investigate dance in depth? What made you decide to... Yeah, it is a... It is a it is a really, uh, it is a really uh, a building up story of that I, I really was dancing as a kid a lot, mm. really even do ballroom dancing with my mother or in these parties with my cousins and aunts. I, I would I would always dance, uh, and but but of course never thinking of a career in that that field as a professional career. Um, it was really a wish to uh, be involved in theater and in a world that was a fantasy world that was not real living world, but was uh, was fiction and fantasy. Mm. And um, and I went a lot to the theater as a kid uh, with um, not with my parents, but more with school. Mm -hmm. So my parents were not very cultural. Uh, I'm coming from a working class family, but I, I had the chance to, uh, to go to uh, higher school education and within that there was a lot of culture that, that would be provided in school. And uh, later on, uh, I, I really, I did civil service because I didn't want to join the army and I, it was the moment when I said I have to leave my city of birth and go to uh, to work somewhere else and I choose a place Ham in Westfalen but for a reason because there was a there was a dance theater company that worked with amateurs and I thought like oh maybe there's an entry into something and there we did actually musicals mm -hmm. we we did dancing and singing musicals and w the woman who was in charge of the dance Annette Bruckner had a ballet studio and she was teaching ballet and jazz and aerobics and and we all were as this member of the companies we were free to take these classes so i went to this ballet studio five days a week mm -hmm. in the evenings and there was a circle of friends developing that we shared this is what was our evening entertainment and then we did the shows and it was quite successful and it, it was just a really nice um uh yeah beginning into a semi-professional dance world and then i really understand that this is not what i want to do i want to look for where is the new things happening what's actually happening in dance and theater at the moment and i went to gießen 
which is a, a university city, and they had a um, a study called Angewandte Theaterwissenschaften, Applied Theater Studies. And I saw in a festival there, students from the School for New Dance Development. And with an instant, I was like, this is where I need to go. This is what I want to do. Do you remember the, and, the uh, can I interrupt you? Do you remember that physical, I mean, you said it very clearly and there was a movement involved now when you said that, but can you, can you remember the feeling in your body where, where that recognition? Yeah, no, it was very, it, it was just a, a, a sense of clarity, mm. a sense of grounding, a sense of like, ha, huh, I, I found, mm. I found something that interests me. And the, I think the, the, one of the most important things was that I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. It was unknown to me. Mm -hmm. I saw something and I couldn't name it. I saw something and I was like, I, this, is, this is it, but I don't know what it is. And so then I got into the search. I, st I talked to the students there and uh, I talked uh, to the people who were in that festival and they said, there's just a change happening in that school. They, the, the most interesting teachers leave the school and found a new school in Arnhem mm -hmm. in a different city in Holland. Mm -hmm. And they said, if I would, were you, I would try that new school. And so I, I went and I did audition and I, I got into that school, which was the European dance development. I think then it was still called the center for new dance development, but after a while, this was too close to the school for new dance development, and they changed it to European Dance Development Center. And it was really, uh, I mean, Esther talked about it in her podcast, but it was really heaven. It was so incredible to meet all these teachers, uh, to have, uh, I think one of the most important things that Art Huche, who was the director, uh implemented was he wanted studios with good floors with good wooden floors that was his like Objective. a point yeah. uh clean warm with wood floor sprung floor studios and so there were four rather big studios with a, a perfect wooden floor to dance on and to roll on and to uh be barefoot on and to slide and to, it was really and within this objectives um they i think that stayed with me also quite quite uh, a lot that the space is very important where you work but the amount of um, time i think you guys also had if we're talking about space what i hear is is that you had like six weeks i guess sometimes with with Resident. Yeah, this was a this was just a very different structure of education that that was modeling after uh, like the the 1980s, where a lot with people would go and take workshops with people and also longer workshops with people. So it was um, it it the structure was that it was basically workshop based. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had one teacher usually for six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, and then you would change the teacher for another six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. So the year was planned in these bigger chunks of workshops, which for some people uh, was really difficult because it didn't have the, it didn't have the underlying practice, mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that you do over time to work your body, but you had chunks of this and then you had chunks of this and then you had chunks of this. But for me, this was really perfect. I, I don't know, maybe it, it, it fit my nature of like, I, I forgot, like on Friday, we had, I was in this system and on Monday I had to change the system. <laughs> and it, it was sometimes difficult and sometimes not, but for me, it really fitted. And if we're talking about the style or the uh, sort of the main, um, uh, like the main ingredients of the soup at the time, I would think that it was all kind of postmodern, post Judson investigation, or did you have yeah, different techniques it, or different styles? I did call it, I did call it later in my research post Judson avant garde. Um, but it was really the time when artists would, I mean, this was one of art's things. He would invite artists to work with the students. It was not so much teachers. Mm -hmm. It was choreographers and dancers that would teach their method or 
their practice or their how they are busy with with composition. Nevertheless, it was rooted at that time still with because Lisa Krauss was there as a staff teacher and Eva Karczak was there who were both uh, former Trisha Brown company dancers. So there was quite a, a, a focus on complex movement uh, within the situation of release technique um, and uh, um, Tony Thatcher and Eva Karczak would also be Alexander technique teachers. It was quite a while quite some rolling on the floor, quite some lying down, imagining movement, quite some hands on, uh, quite some also quiet work. But uh, there, there, I think there is quite a prejudice that no other work has been done there. But I do remember, for instance, Sarah Skaggs coming from New York, really teaching more jazz, jazzy, uh, moves with counts mm. and there was a lot of people a lot of students even who were prejudiced against oh my god uh, anything oh my with counts. counts counting really now <laughs> and then but then I do remember I was in this class and I also liked it and then and then Ava Karza came and took the class mm -hmm. and I was a little bit like ah oh, you see, it's it, you see it's like it's not one or the other mm -hmm. it's not black and white or good and bad it's not quiet or counting or I don't know it, it was in this way really a quite a, a complex set of uh, um, moving that was actually taught there and also I think the other thing that you could like if you would talk we were a class of like maybe 13 people or 14 and if you would at the end look or ask people about their education the, me, people had very different ways people didn't end at the same with the same information people ended with different traces of information that they took that gave them something yeah, yeah. so it's also very the in the output also is very individual beautiful and I'm assuming, but I'm also asking, is that where you first encountered improvisation and or contact improvisation? Uh, while I was in while I was in Ham doing my musical uh, training and chorus line and uh, had uh, I'm trying uh, to imagine movement. it. Like, I, look, I can kind of see it. <laughs> next to next to Ham, there was a there was a the next bigger city was Münster. And in Münster, there was actually a woman, Christina Grunert, who was teaching at uh, Kreativhaus. And she already made improvisational workshops and also contact uh, workshops. Mm. So my first contact teacher was actually Christina Grunert in Münster, but she had invited uh, a lot of other people. Uh, in fact, one of the teachers that was teaching there is... Uh, Betty Schechter is now Batya Schechter. That is a whole other story. If we have another two hours, I can go into this. But Betty, I met as a student, uh, like I was a student in Münster. She was teaching. She just finished s and mm. and And that was, I think, 1988. And we haven't seen each other since, except I was performing my solo choreographing books, I think in 2011, in Jerusalem and there was a woman in the audience who was captivated with what I'm doing mm. and uh, we talked afterwards and we chatted and we talked and after 10 minutes I was a little bit like wait you are you used to be Betty and then yeah why how do you know this you were my first teacher of improvisation and uh, anything of this sort and then I said, oh, yeah, I do remember that workshop that I was teaching in Münster, but I don't remember you. Yeah. And I also, like, I don't remember anything from that workshop, mm -hmm. except that it was the, the starting point mm -hmm. for me to go to that school. Beautiful. So it sounds like that was really formative years uh, in terms of becoming an artist, not just technical or artistic tools that you guys receive, but really what it means to be, to be, think, feel, live, or identify yourself as an artist. Would you agree? 
Uh, yeah, even more. I think it was even more because when my last and we used to we, we had to write a dossier uh, for the school at the end of four years, and I I didn't know what to write, so I did ask Lisa Kraus to interview me. Mm. Uh, at the end, and we had this uh, back and forth talk, and then I transcribed the interview. And then I think one of her remarks was really that she said uh, this education was not only an artistic education, but it also uh, formed you as a person, as a as a man. She actually mm -hmm. said, and I think that was really true. It, I mean, it is the it was that in my twenties. Uh, and as a gay man, I was not in, it was not in sync with uh, my, uh, my life, but even in the nineties, it, it, it was some work, but it was really the, the best step to, mm. um, to fall into my body, to fall into my possibilities, to acknowledge my possibilities, and then to, uh, to, to move and be as that person. Mm. I mean, this might uh, be a quite personal question, but I'm going to ask it and you can always say no, but um, was was the part of you that discovered that you you were gay? Was that a part that came along as you were also becoming a dancer or was that a part? Um, I mean, was your coming out at the same time or was that earlier? Or how How is the timeline between those two um, identities also? I, I think it's it's much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I, I knew that I was gay long long ago i mean if i look at children photos of myself i i i see that i'm gay i'm a gay kid mm -hmm. i'm a gay boy mm -hmm. uh, i i see that uh, and uh and 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 of course the struggle is more with with uh with the family with the society there's struggle and i i do think the wish to go to the theater or the wish to become a dancer or the wish to even because i'm also a hairdresser mm -hmm. Yeah, I studied hairdressing. Mm -hmm. The wish to become a hairdresser was uh, a weird, uh, almost like a, a, a fulfilling of cliches, a fulfilling of something that that was bound to be uh, to break out and to fulfill other roles. But um, the dancing, it's not so much that the dancing helped, but I think more the the awareness techniques uh, of who, how a body works and that sexuality is so much part of the bodily functions and how the body is relating to other people and then uh, the, the freeing yourself from the, from the labels and then identifying as a gay man and then becoming, mm -hmm. getting older and maybe identifying as a queer man or as a but you know, it's, it's, it's the society and the development, especially in this uh, sexuality matters in the last ten years, is also really quite uh, refreshing and great. Still, mm. you know, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I, I don't know. Beautiful. I'm not. Uh, I'm, fl I'm. I'm fluid. Beautiful. I remember uh, the lecture that you gave at Tanzkwatia. And I don't know if it was the post Judson avant garde lecture. I think it was, but you specifically at one point talked about the development of uh, of of this postmodern era uh, in connection with homosexual men or the contribution of homosexual men to to those uh, to that area and specifically to dance. Is that uh, something that you uh, do? You want to share that a little bit or a summary of that? Yeah, I mean, it's more like when I'm my my objectives when I'm since I'm busy with history is also like I'm standing here and I can envision my past into the back. I can search the past mm -hmm. into the back that's interesting me. And in this way, I of course, I think like uh, lots of things in dance started with Cage and Cunningham and the just the democratization of space. Uh, the democratization of body parts that there's not one center there's more centers <clears throat> and from from that in the direct line would then be steve paxton who would uh, be uh, a dancer in the cunningham company and then a founder or co-founder of contact improvisation and still a, an incredible improviser a, a thinker of improvisation and uh and, and his life in the 60s and 70s would would still be he, he would also not be an out gay man but he would also not hide it too much but 
and and then there has been a lot of uh, figures around uh, uh, Remy Charlip. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's just full of uh, homosexual or queer men and also lesbian women yeah. who are who are starting to write, like Susan Foster or like it, it's it's not it it there is a dance and it's an experimental dance and if you want to call it postmodern dance, there there is a there, there is a lot of queerness. Uh, that 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 supports it. At the same time, uh, we also know that this is a very American and a very white story. Mm -hmm. So to to think again new, I'm sure there's more uh, queer or there's more feminist uh, um, founders that we just don't know of because the archives have not been searched enough or oh, it the, wasn't the documented. personal interest it was of people wasn't documented they weren't seen and... or even that yeah, yes yeah, yes yeah. i i love the fact that you're in so many ways i as i experience always busy with history and also with with reading or with uh, with books i remember also at one of the festivals in 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 hungary you just sat there with a bunch of books in the pauses of the festival and you sat down and I think it was the year Sarah Shelton Mann and Nita Little were there and they sat down with you and you guys just started discussing the history of contact improvisation and people were just ear dropping and just you know my jaw dropped I remember you know like hearing from these pioneers on on the different sides of the coast and hearing their different kinds of stories but it was so beautiful because it was so simple also in a way you just sat down with your books and you were like in my story you were just like okay let's see what happens and then they came and they started talking and sharing their stories and I feel also or, or I remember also hearing from Nita and I think I also heard it from Sarah how thankful they also were to have been given the space to talk about that part of their end of the story. That of course it's, you know, the contact improvisation is attributed to Steve's work, but there are so many other people who were involved and there's different stories also around it. Do you remember? Yeah, I, I mean, one thing, yeah, yeah, it's too, like one thing I come to the books later, yeah. but one thing that I was also invited to talk uh, on my history of contact improvisation at the CI 36 fest in Tanzfabrik, Berlin. Uh, there was also, there was a short panel and I had to make a little, my little story. And, and at the end I figured out, oh, I, actually Steve would, would not teach me contact improvisation in, in the school. He would teach other things. At he would teach material for the spine in Arnhem. Mm -hmm. He would teach uh, like rolling, Aikido rolling, uh, but he would not teach contact improvisation. Contact improvisation, I learned from Nancy, from KJ, from Susan Shell, from uh, Aspects, from uh, Jennifer Monson, from, uh, from uh, Mary Overly was not teaching contact, but it was informing me a lot. Susan Shell was teaching authentic movement mm. with contact, you know, and then it was really like my, at the end, I said, I learned contact, I studied contact improvisation with women only, <laughs> basically. So, so this is one of the dichotomies of that. And then of course, involvement with Nita also later on in her career, in her teaching and in her writing uh, aspects. Um, about the books, um, it, it really comes down to one of the students in Arnhem that was with me was Karen Sheffman. And Karen Sheffman was one of the first or one of the uh, students that were enrolled in the first PhD program for dance in a university in America. And Karen would send me their reading lists. And, and I was at that moment, um, I, I was still in Arnhem, but, or I moved already to Berlin. And I was trying to find these books or articles, the internet wasn't working yet so well that you could just go and find books and purchase them and they get sent to you. Uh, you really had to look and it, it was the beginning of my search for books 
on dance and dance uh, history and theory. And out of this was a little, started a little obsession with books. And I think it rather came from an aspect of uh, emancipation that I, that I still think dance needed and maybe still needs today a sort of uh, making space for itself. Uh, in terms of value of uh, profession, but also value in the art fields and val value in the research field. So I think there was a big moment of emancipation connected to the collection of books and the busyness of books. And how oh, you see these smart people think it's value something and these smart people think it's value something. And these smart people think I'm a smart person because, you know, it's, it's this kind of... Yeah. And, and the other aspect is, of course, that I do feel that books are a body of knowledge as the body is a body of knowledge. So also this, this metaphor of having a book with weight <laughs> and that you can turn the pages and has a smell. That was always important for me in this. And I've always traveled with books. I'm still doing it mm -hmm. uh, when I teach. And uh, of course, nowadays, there's more and more and more books. And uh, one of the person that I share this um, maybe obsession with is Agnes Benoit Nader. Mm -hmm. Agnes Benoit, with her bookstore, Books on the Move, that you can find a lot of uh, dance books mm -hmm. online now. I had the pleasure of uh, staying in your apartment one time when I was teaching a dance oh, public yeah. in Berlin, you guys weren't there, but I got to hang out yes. with your library, I have to say. It was a very <laughs> nice day. Uh, I did not go out in the evenings. No. I just read your books and looked at them. It was super nice, super nice library. Yeah, really. some of them are also really rare, mm. rare books mm. and rare finds. Mm. And I, I really hunted for mm. some of them. And also, I like I like your approach of dealing with uh, written word or or with uh, documentation. Uh, I I was I remember your performance. I don't know what it was called, but you did a performance once, or at least I know of, where you just brought all of your contact quarterlies, and I think you have all of them, and you ran them. And I think it was a longer performance, also through. Uh, I I think few hours not just uh, a regular performance setting um, and you just randomly picked one of the magazines randomly opened up one page started reading something and I don't know how it continued from there but again the sense of improvisation the sense of chance the sense of um, it, this is the right moment this is the right content right here it touches me because because there is sort of this scholarly approach to books or writing that also has a very linear path. And if we break that open a little bit and, and combine or play with the connection between dance, movement, physicality, and the written word, it becomes less stiff also. It just becomes more tangible or more physical also. And I think it's so needed in our dance field also is to, to be able to talk about the value of our work and to be able to articulate what it is, is that, that we're teaching each other or that we're, we're investigating here. And I, um, I really appreciate that. I appreciate your level of curiosity, not only on the research event, but also on the uh, practical use or the practical application of it. Did it have a title? Did that performance have a title? Uh, and I think it's a it's a it's an offspring of that piece of that solo that I made in two thousand five called choreographing books, mm. and uh, I did it in different sit sit settings with different books. And when I, when you I think the reading with the contact quarterly back issues was really together with Agnes Benoit, mm -hmm. and and we did it for eight hours. It was an eight hour performance and we did different reading scores. Mm. Um, I think that, uh, or I know that Agnes is very close to Simon Forti. So there is also with Simon, there's a very specific way of uh, tr dealing with words also in improvisation and text and improvisation. And I, of course, I'm also 
kind of really close to Deborah Hay and her practice of scoring and writing. And so I, I do think there is really also quite some experimentation in that field that we just have to remind ourselves and, and do. Hmm. Now, Peter, uh, somewhere along the line of your story, I remember even um, you decided I'm at a certain age, I'm just going to really go for this choreographing thing again. Like you had been doing, you had been dancing professionally, you had been choreographing, you had been teaching, you had been programming or artistic director at these different places. And then something happened, and I'm wondering what that was, where you decided, okay, this is the time now for me to really focus on my choreography. And I think it was uh, around 2014, 15, when you started mm -hmm. really producing. 14 was a big year, yeah. yeah. And what was that? What, what can you can you describe that moment, or do you remember? Yeah, I think it's I think it's really again two things that are that are with me also from the beginning of the talk now that uh, that I do think places where you uh, where you want to be where you want to make your life have an impact on how you wanna how you're developing your your ways and so. The 10 years that I spent in Arnhem was very much education for four years with an international idea of traveling afterwards, with being in a company and with finding the first uh, support, financial support to make work in Arnhem, in Holland. And there were three years that I could make actually my own choreography. Uh, at that time, Arnhem was, it's a small Dutch city, uh, and uh, I was already uh, together with Michiel and we were actually thinking, is this the, t the town where we want to live or uh, keep working? And we decided to, to go away into a bigger city and it, it, it ended up to be Berlin. We had a few options. But then in Berlin in 2000, it wasn't the, the independent dance sector was not developed. Uh, so it was not easy to to think like oh i've been a, a, a supported choreographer in holland i come here and the doors will fling open and people will give me money to make work um, th this was just not the case so uh, it took me really quite a while to understand what what happened here in berlin and it was very very different than what i've studied mm -hmm. and what i've lived since uh, since a few years now and there was a big realization of, that's why I think teaching was so important also to really spread this knowledge that was then contained in, in that school in Holland. And that of course, a little bit further with people going uh, away and teaching, but um, it was very, very hard work here in Berlin to, to implement some of what I like to see and what I like to be. And then I started, well, it's maybe easier to curate and I was given a position and I was asked to curate uh, a festival and later a theater. Mm -hmm. And because the scene in Berlin is so vast, there are so many people here making work, it was also there quite impossible to, to articulate a certain vision of what it actually is that you want as a curator. And in 2014, or a little bit before, I was actually thinking, what would happen if I, if I channel all that energy that I'm now spreading over so many, how would it be to channel that on my work? And what if I do that, would that be now? And then it was uh, already with the help of uh, Stephanie Maher at, uh, uh, since, since I came in 2000 into Berlin, we started building Ponderosa, this outside of Berlin, countryside, studios, living spaces, working spaces, where I would go every summer, as I would go every summer to Esther's Budapest Festival. So within Stolzenhagen, which was outside of Berlin, no funding involved, you can just go there, you can work on things you want to work, you can develop in a certain atmosphere, in a certain setting. It was there that I, that Steph actually, it wasn't mine, Steph actually asked me 
Peter, I think you should make a little solo. And so I made a little solo here, a little solo there. I, I think like, what do I want to do? And in 2014, I was asked to make a solo for, I think this is an important link, the Life Legacy Project in Tanzhaus Düsseldorf was organized by Karen Schaffman and Angela Guerrero, where they were researching how all that information coming from School for New Dance Development, coming from European Dance Development Center, coming from Dardington College of Arts into Europe and how that changed the landscape of contemporary dance. And for that occasion, I was asked to make a solo. And this was basically my first appearance as a maker in public. And at the same time, I got a big funding here in Berlin to make a first group work, which dealt with history of contemporary of these influences in Berlin. And so within that year, I could make a solo that I performed in Düsseldorf and later in Impulse Dance, and I made uh, uh, this group piece, Visible Undercurrent, for Sophie and Zähler, uh, where I involve like my my teachers, Eva Karczak, Mark Tompkins, Yoshiko Chuma, as kind of the my teachers, and they then I involve. Max Stewart here in Berlin and Sascha Waltz here in Berlin as a generation that much closer to my generation. And I invite four or five younger dancers that I have taught uh, to form an intergenerational improvisational group that, uh, that then performs improvisation. And later we made a little piece with this information, which, yeah, it was really a, a shift into I'm not curating anymore. I don't want that power. Uh, I, I want to articulate my work and what I want to say and what I want to do. It's a beautiful story. And even even just physically watching you, like describing with your arms or with your body saying, OK, I was spreading out all that energy out there and then I'm just gathering it in here. And what would I do with this? And to me, it's always interesting to watch artists develop and I think it's it's a beautiful story also because dance is so uh, it, it's such a young body uh, art form or it's not anymore but it used to be so much and so I, in 2014 you were how old can I ask fifty fifty and now I re yeah I remember that you said I'm fifty and now I'm really <laughs> I'm really deciding to do this. Yeah. And I was so oh, yes. I was so happy for you. I was so proud of you. Of yeah, and I think it's so beautiful because so many artists actually kick in in their fifties and in their sixties, and it doesn't. It yeah. I mean, I I feel like yes, of course, it's a it's a dance form or it's an art form that thrives on the physicality and the abilities that we have as young bodies. But we have so much to share, and we're so healthier than than many dancers were also. Uh, in the previous generations, I mean, we have so much more uh, such healthier techniques also to deal with. But just to also really, I mean, to come back to that decision of saying what would or that question, what would I do? And then to take to take that seriously, and then to let also the world sort of give you the spaces to. I mean, it. it what I'm hearing is is that the world responded, that the institutions, the money came. Um, it responded mm -hmm. to your decision. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, to the aging, to the aging body and the aging dancer, there's uh, there's really quite something to say because I do think we are, we are the generation that that, that like I always say my my teachers my teachers danced and worked until they died or some of them are also still alive, but. Uh, really quite some died in the past two years or so. Um, but uh, it's really us, our generation, that is changing that. Uh, and, and it's happening. I see it. I mean, I, I, I have no intention in stopping. So I have a lot of people that I work with uh, have no intentions of stopping. So uh, it's, it's, it's really in the making that... Mm you know, Eva and Simon Forti and even Steve, mm. you know, they, they, they are my teachers and examples mm. 
and I, I yeah, I have no, I, 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 I keep doing. Well, <laughs> no, I don't know anything else. Very actively. Um, <laughs> so I would like to talk about the company uh, that you actually uh, uh, founded. It's called Cranky Bodies, a company, and you founded it together with Mikiel uh, Kuiper. Is that his? Is that how mm -hmm. you pronounce his name? That's also your partner, and you guys have been together mm -hmm. for a long time. So that's another really long time collaboration. I, I think you guys mm -hmm. have been working together over many years, but now you've really sort of created a setting for an intense uh, uh, collaboration. You collaborate with different artists. Um, it's a collaborative setting, as I understand it also. But uh, what is it that you're working on? What is, what is your next project? I think it's important to understand that there is a there is a, a sense of growing and growth in in all of this that uh, that I I just or we just wanted to cultivate. So since since we started the first groupies in uh, 2014 and then uh, made another work in 2017 called Cranky Bodies Dance Reset, where we actually researched much more. Uh, uh, improvisational structures and compositions during performing, um, which I always say that this piece, Cranky Bodies Dance Reset, uh, is a 90-minute dance that, that choreographs itself. And what we did for this piece, we worked on contemplative movement practice with Barbara Dilley for 10 weeks every day a contemplative movement practice with the same people so that and there was no interference from me as the director of the company who would select uh moments or phrases or whatever it was a collaborative process of we like this we like this oh this is good oh when this happened so there was an incredible complex knowledge uh, developed over these 10 uh, weeks and the performance was an open score. We knew how to start and we knew how to end and we had a timer for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. That was the that was the score. And up till then, um, it was in this way really quite radical to to not have a structure. I mean, this is how we began the whole our whole conversation today. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what this company is and wants to provide is conditions to meet and dance together and research scores and practices that maybe come from the past and have, people have researched and then put it into the now and put it into what it means now. And I think the next project is called Terrestrial Transit. And uh, I do think we want to concentrate on uh, Nancy Stark Smith underscore and how how that can foster us into new understandings of group choreography, improvisation, being together in space. Mm, beautiful. One thing that strikes me, though, it's on the one hand, your commitment to the process, to improvisation, to the really in-depth uh, collaboration with your dancers and and giving that uh, trusting that open space but also that there's a very clear visual component to it there's a very clear visual design to it and i'm wondering and we're just about to wrap up our our conversation here but how you how you design that also with michiel together is that just as improvisational as the dance or is that how do you how do you play with sort of having to make certain decisions for costumes or for set pieces or that that concreteness of 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 uh, material things versus the improvisational movement? Again, this there's many answers and it's it's a double fold answer. But one of course is uh, visual design as music is a vehicle for audience to experience the dance mm. so the visual design is like the music it's like a it's like a, a a step into the work of uh of into our work 
this is the one answer of like it's really helping the composition to be seen appreciate it's a very specific approach from the visual designer because oftentimes it's just being sort of plastered on top of something just to look good but or with music also oftentimes music is just being put on not understanding what's actually going on in the in the dance or not supporting the dance enough but sort of having to you know do its own thing so it, that in and of itself takes a certain a certain amount of sensitivity towards dance and this is the other part of the answer mm. that uh, Michiel is, of course, very much involved in dance mm. and my education and all my pieces and everything. He saw a lot. He knows a lot of people. He, he's been with me in, in my development in dance. And furthermore, it, it really, there, there's a very specific aspect in the, how, how Michiel works and he calls it transitional sculptures. So he was actually looking as a visual artist into a into translating uh, what is happening for dance that it's there at the moment and it's gone when it's done into sculpture or into costuming. So there's a lot of sculpture that appears while the show is going on and it disappears at the same time, nothing is staying there. So the composition happens at the moment, the sculpture happens at the moment, just as the improvisation or the dance is happening at the moment. And for instance, in costume, and it, it usually goes so far that uh, there's usually costumes that are color coordinated and there's costumes that have a, a connection and each member of the company can change costume as they see fit for the scene or as they see fit for uh, that next scene. Or um, So there is a real big element in of the each performer making a choice of costuming uh, according to the improvisation or according to what's happening. And, and so there, there is really quite some connection in the understanding of the visual composition and the improvisation of the dancers. Beautiful. Well, Peter, it's so nice to talk to you. So nice to hear your story, your long developments also. I love hearing people's stories that really develop over time. And it's so visible for you also, I feel honored to have witnessed some of that i hope to see more of that and uh, thank you thank you for what you've shared well thank you for giving this opportunity and i i, I p storytelling is part of my practice and my solo work a lot mm -hmm. also so uh there, there's quite and and this has it might seem very natural, but is a lot of work and a lot of uh, a development there, even to be able to to speak to you like this. It's not. Uh, it's not. It didn't come to me easily. Well, I hope you felt comfortable enough to share your stories here. I, very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, I look forward to seeing your work. I look forward to seeing you live again soon. Take care. Bye bye. Me too. Yes. <laughs> Let's keep on dancing. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. If you would like to know more about Holistic Dance and the Holistic Dance Institute, please visit us at our website www.holistic-dance.at. Holistic Dance is an invitation to transformation through dance, movement and touch. It was founded by me, Sabine Parzer, in 2010. It is a mix of different methods, a dynamic cross-method approach from dance pedagogical, dance and body therapeutic, systemic and holistic methods. We offer authentic movement, integrative contact improvisation, somatics and applied anatomy, improvisation, ecosomatics and many more elements. I offer holistic dance workshops, I offer single sessions, I offer teachers trainings, embodiment trainings, advanced teachers tracks, year groups and retreats. I would be very happy to see you at one of our events. And if you have any questions, please write me an email.